I love poetry. I want to go to college. I want to teach Latin. Perhaps my chosen path is to become a nun. These are the dreams of Beverly Jaros, and this is the reality of what became of her. This is the Beverly Jaros Cold Case. Beverly Jaros was a beautiful teenage girl from Garfield Heights, Ohio. She lived with her parents and younger sister in a nice suburban neighborhood just outside the greater Cleveland area. Her father, Thaddeus, owned Universal Lighting and Manufacturing Company, and her mother had a part-time secretarial job. The 16-year-old attended Marymount High School, along with a small circle of close friends and several male suitors that vied for the attention of the lovely young brunette. Her parents had only recently allowed her to date the cousin of her best friend, Margie. Beverly was very studious and an avid reader. With a great love of poetry, she began to compile many beautiful pieces she had written in hopes of maybe one day seeing them published. She had just begun to write some of her poetry in a leather-bound journal that she received from her father that Christmas of 1964, a journal whose pages would never be completely filled, pages that would never see the poetic words of its talented young writer. Three days after Christmas, Monday, December 28, 1964, the lives of the Jaros family would change forever. Tragically, in one of the most heinous crimes imaginable, this loving family and their close-knit community would suffer the loss of Beverly at the hands of a psychopath, a senseless act of horrific violence that would extinguish the bright future of this Ohio team. Beverly's story begins the summer of 64. The family started to receive hang-up calls. Sometimes they would receive 12 calls a day. These calls would suddenly stop three months before the murder. There were other strange occurrences that year that would set the family's nerves on edge. At a back door that the family rarely ever used, gifts were found for Beverly a silver bracelet, and a ring. A card was left on the box that simply read, For Bev. On another occasion, they would find a piece of costume jewelry placed inside their mailbox. Then there was the evening when Mr. Jaros pulled into their driveway and spotted a man in their front yard staring up at Beverly's second-story bedroom window. He gave chase, but the man was able to elude him. Beverly began to feel fearful in her once safe neighborhood. She always kept the doors locked and always peered through the curtains to see who was at the door if the doorbell rang. Out of fear of being stalked or pursued by a secret admirer, Beverly always placed phone calls to her family to let them know she was safe. After Beverly's murder, it was discovered in some of her poetry that she had written about death her own death. Did Beverly somehow know that she wasn't going to live very long? Beverly's mother would also share in this ill-fated premonition. Let's take a look at the timeline of events that took place the day Beverly was murdered. Beverly's mother, Eleanor, remembers having an uncomfortable feeling as everyone gathered around the table that morning for breakfast. The feeling only a mother feels when she knows her child is in danger. For Eleanor, keeping that premonition at bay was difficult. She never said anything to her daughter. 
and the weight of that decision she would carry with her forever. After breakfast, Beverly's parents left for work and she and her 12-year-old sister Carol left to go to their grandmother's house about a mile away. But first, they would run a couple of errands. They first stopped at Woolworths to pick up a hairnet for their grandmother. Carol remembered later that she had laid her purse on the counter and put the house keys on top of the purse. When she turned back to pick up her purse, the keys were missing. Mrs. Jarrow said the keys were later found in a coat pocket. What happened to the keys and their relevance to this case remains a mystery. The girls left Woolworths and went to Huff's Bakery to pick up a loaf of bread before continuing on to their grandmother's. Upon arriving at their grandmother's house, Beverly places some phone calls. At 11 a.m., Beverly calls her friend Barbara to discuss their plans for the day. At 11.30 a.m., Beverly calls her best friend Margie and tells her that she and Barbara will be over between 1 and 2 p.m. At 12.15 p.m., Beverly's grandmother calls her neighbor and asks if her 18-year-old son could drive Beverly home so she could spend the afternoon with her friends. After returning home from a job interview, the 18-year-old young man changes clothes and runs Beverly home. Beverly is dropped off in the driveway of her home and goes inside. This is the last time anyone saw Beverly alive. These are the following phone calls made and received just before Beverly's murder. At 12.30 p.m., Beverly receives a phone call from a jeweler saying that her grandmother's necklace wasn't worth fixing. At 1 p.m., Beverly phones her mother at work and relays the jeweler's message and lets her know that she is safe. At 1.15 p.m., Beverly receives a call from Steve Stankowitz and leaves a message for her father that Stankowitz called and would try to reach him later. The name would turn out to be a fake. At 1.20 p.m., Beverly's grandmother calls to check on her. Beverly tells her that Barbara is at the door and she has to go. At 1.25 p.m., Barbara arrives and rings the doorbell at the side door about 10 times. She sees that the screen door is locked, but the main door is open. Barbara then goes to the front door and waits while looking at a magazine. She can hear a radio upstairs playing loudly. She then hears what sounds like furniture being moved and then a thump like a dresser being knocked over. Barbara starts to think Beverly is standing her up or playing a joke and decides to leave. A friend picks Barbara up at the corner and drives her home. Police would later verify these facts. This next set of phone calls were made before Beverly was found murdered. 2 p.m. Barbara calls Beverly, but doesn't get an answer. At 2.45 p.m., Margie calls Barbara and asks where the two girls were. At 3.45 p.m., Margie calls Beverly's grandmother and asks about Beverly. At 4 p.m., Carol calls home, but doesn't get an answer. So their grandmother calls Mr. Jaros at work and said that she was alarmed because they couldn't get a hold of Beverly. At 4.10 p.m., Mr. Jaros arrives home to check on Beverly. He can hear the loud radio from the driveway. 
he finds the back door that they rarely use open at a 45 degree angle. The two side doors were both open at a 90 degree angle. Now alarmed because he knows Beverly always locks all the doors, he runs upstairs and finds her murdered. At 4.15 p.m., Carol calls home to see what's going on. Her father picks up the phone, and all he can do is scream, Murder. Murder. Upon arriving at the scene, Garfield Heights police would have to quickly rein in their emotions in order to track down this brutal and violent killer. Detective Captain William Horrigan took control of one of the worst crimes of his career. The scene of Beverly's murder was a nightmare from which no one would ever wake from. Beverly's trussed up, lifeless body lay face down on the floor beside her bed. Her body had been bound with rope at the neck and ankles. The 5 foot 8, 118 pound teen was covered in blood. Her blouse, penetrated by a 4 to 5 inch blade, had been pulled up and her bra was ripped. Her stretch pants had been pulled down, leaving her partially nude. Beverly has sustained over 42 stab wounds. Most of the wounds were two inches deep, with the most serious ones found on her neck and face. The other slashes were found on her chest, back, and hands. Twelve of the cuts on Beverly's hands were probably from trying to fend off her attacker. Nine stab wounds were found going down the center of her back from her neck to her waist. No DNA found under her nails, so the killer would have no scratch marks. Police found three short lengths of rope at the scene. One short strand was found between Beverly's fingers that was slashed from the longer one that had been pulled taut about her neck and draped across her body. The other one was used to bind her ankles. There was no sexual assault. Cause of death was listed as strangulation, but the coroner said her stab wounds were also fatal. The time of death was given anywhere from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Beverly's bedroom was spattered with blood, so much so that it was quite evident that she had put up a terrific struggle for her life. Blood was found smeared on the walls and her bed was covered in it. Beverly's struggle was so fierce that she had kicked a piece of plaster loose from the sloping ceiling above her bed. Several sets of prints were lifted from the crime scene, including some bloody partials from fingers and palms. Four of them didn't belong to Beverly or a family member. There were also a few articles of clothing strewn about the room. Savage doesn't begin to describe the murder of Beverly Jaros. Who would want to do this to this bright and beautiful young girl with so much ahead of her? Many of the girl's suitors had been questioned and some even submitted to a lie detector test. The usual suspects were rounded up, some with prior records, some who committed violent acts against women, and some known for stabbing. Most of these suspects were cleared and some just went into the inconclusive pile. But there was one suspect that looked like the most promising lead the police would ever have. The suspect was 17-year-old Harry Joseph Maydahl, an encyclopedia salesman at the time of the murder. Maydahl had moved from Michigan to just a mile and a half from the Jarrell's home three months before the murder. Before he became a door-to-door -door salesman, he worked at Halley's department store and may have come into contact with Beverly 
as this was one of her favorite places to shop. Maydahl had a long record of violent behavior beginning at the age of two. He was accused of breaking and entering at the age of nine. At 16, he raped his stepmother, threatened to kill his two half-siblings, and attacked three women by knife point. He came up on the police radar after he was arrested for stabbing a pregnant housewife, Gerda Leedy. Maydahl had entered her home under the guise of selling her some encyclopedias, then proceeded to attack her with a knife, stabbing her once in the stomach before being scared off by a neighbor who heard the commotion. The mother and child were lucky to have survived the attack. Under interrogation, Maydahl admitted to killing Jaros and then recanted. He submitted to four lie detector tests that all came back inconclusive. Police said his responses were erratic and irresponsible. Sometimes he wouldn't respond at all or just started weeping. Police also said that his fingerprints when compared to those at the crime scene also came back inconclusive. Details that Maydahl gave about Beverly's murder did not match up to actual events, and the knife that he used to stab Mrs. Leedy was smaller than the one used in Beverly's murder. Maydahl was never charged in Beverly's murder. His last known residence was somewhere in Germany. Over the years, the facts in this case were just as confusing and baffling as the murder itself. Let's take a look at some of those facts now. Fact number one, Beverly always locked the doors, so whoever murdered her, she must have recognized and let them in because there were no signs of forced entry. Fact number two, the message that Beverly took for her father from Steve Stankiewicz was found by the kitchen phone. It read, Steve Stankiewicz called, we'll call back later. The words called and later were underlined. The only Steve Stankiewicz the name could be traced back to was a 17-year-old that had moved out of the country a year prior to the murder. Handwriting experts said that the message was written under heavy pressure and anxiety. Fact number three, Madoff was known to use aliases over the years. But even if he was the one who called using Stankiewicz's name to see if Beverly was home, how would he know that she was alone? If the call came in at 1.15, how could he have had time to walk a mile and a half in less than 10 minutes to Beverly's house? Because Barbara arrived at 1.25, and from her statement of hearing noises and loud music, we can assume the killer was already inside before she arrived. Fact number four, Maydahl wasn't living in Ohio when Beverly started receiving hang-up calls and jewelry. Fact number five, when Maydahl was arrested in January for stabbing Mrs. Leedy, he had three healing cuts, two on his face and one on his wrist. He also didn't have an alibi for the day of Beverly's murder. Fact number six, Detective Captain Horrigan focused on Beverly's boyfriend, Roger. Roger's first lie detector test was inconclusive and then he passed his second. Until Horrigan retired, he would call Roger every year on the anniversary of Beverly's murder to give an update on the case. Fact number seven, pathologists theorized whoever killed Beverly would have left the scene with smears of her blood on them, plaster from the ceiling, pieces of her hair and flesh, along with threads from the struggle. How did the killer flee when covered in all that evidence and no one noticed in a neighborhood where homes are so close together? Fact number eight, the rope used to strangle Beverly was an old weathered window sash. Police were unable to match it to anyone in the area. Fact number nine. Seven years after the murder, someone broke into the Jaros home 
installed a gold watch and the backing from two of Beverly's favorite prints that her father had framed for her. Fact number 10. Police were never able to determine if Beverly was murdered by a male or a female. Fact number 11. Perhaps the most puzzling of this case is that the only thing missing from the murder scene was Beverly's diary. Is there a possibility the diary contained a secret worth killing for? Who knew Beverly kept a diary and where it could be found? It's been 58 years since Beverly's murder. 1,000 people showed up to say their goodbyes to this beautiful young girl with a brilliant future ahead of her. Her family sat in a state of disbelief during her service at St. Therese Church and wept at her graveside along with family, friends, and investigators. Beverly will never be forgotten. Retired lead detective William Horrigan, who passed away in 2004 at the age of 93, continued to check out leads right up until the day he died. He believed he knew who the killer was, but didn't have enough evidence to bring them to justice. Investigators are still working the case, searching for the murderer, Detective Captain Horrigan called a brutal animal. If you have any information, that could lead investigators to solving this horrific murder of Beverly Jaros, please call the Garfield Police Department at 216-475-1234. In honor of Beverly's life and her love of poetry, I would like to end this episode with a poem dedicated to her. This is A Child of Mine by Edgar Guest. I will lend you for a little time a child of mine, he said, for you to love the while he lives and mourn for when he's dead. It may be six or seven years or twenty-two or three, but will you, till I call him back, take care of him for me? He'll bring his charms to gladden you, and should his stay be brief, you'll have his lovely memories as solace for your grief. I cannot promise he will stay, since all from earth return. But there are lessons taught down there I want this child to learn. I've looked the wide world over in search for teachers true. And from the throngs that crowd life's lanes, I have selected you. Now will you give him all your love, nor think the labor vain? nor hate me when I come to take him home again. I fancied that I heard them say, Dear Lord, thy will be done. For all the joys thy child shall bring, the risk of grief will run. We'll shelter him with tenderness, we'll love him while we may. And for the happiness we've known, forever grateful stay. But should the angels call for him, much sooner than we've planned, will brave the bitter grief that comes and try to understand. Thank you for joining me today. Please take care and be safe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Eye on Justice.